이런 거야. 주 이렇게. Okay, so tonight uh, we continue in the story with chapter 3. The story of Joseph, uh, Joseph in the coat of many colors. Uh, that's a pretty popular story in the scriptures. Um, let me point out one thing to you, actually, in the book. Um, if you, <clears throat> I think I mentioned probably our first session. If you see in your reading um, uh, typed font that is in italics, that is a clue that the author of this book is trying to connect two parts of the story. So if you turn on to page 26 and 27, <clears throat> that's the very end of chapter 2. Um, the chapter 2's focus is on um, the story of Abraham and his direct descendants. Um, and then the last paragraph in chapter 2 on page 26-27 is a italicized paragraph that connects the story of Abraham and his descendants to the story of Jacob and Joseph. Um, because the start of chapter 3, you might have noticed uh, on the next page, jumps right into Joseph's story. does not really talk about his youngest years where, he, uh, where his dad, Israel, gives him that fine coat of many colors and, and treats him so favorably because he is the favorite, right? It jumps right into it where <clears throat> Jacob is asking his youngest son to go out and check on his brothers. So they provide this last paragraph in chapter 2 um, to connect <coughs> two parts of the story. Does that make sense? Okay, so that, that paragraph has some of, of jo uh, Jacob's and Joseph's uh, younger years in there. And then also at the bottom of page 26, this little graphic that, that, uh, that shows the 12, uh, the 12 sons of Jacob and uh, their biological mothers. That's very helpful, I think, especially as we talk about this chapter, to come back and reference this chart um, to kind of get, get an idea of, of the family tree. Um, one thing that bears pointing out is the fact that um, Rachel and Jacob had Joseph and Benjamin. Um, and in, as the story goes, uh, Joseph is... Um, for all intents and purposes, dead to his father. He, he thinks he, that a wild beast has gotten a hold of him and torn him to shreds. Um, and then later in the story, when uh, Joseph takes his rise to fame, uh, he requires to see Benjamin before, which is his biological brother, before he uh, unveils himself, reveals himself as uh, Joseph, the one that they sold into slavery. Uh, so, putting ourselves kind of in Jacob's shoes for a moment, that you've already thought you've lost Joseph, your favorite son, uh, and now perhaps um, as, the brother, as his remaining sons are coming back saying that, that uh, in Egypt they're requiring <laughs> that we leave Benjamin as a slave uh, in prison uh, in order to, to come back and, and get more food, uh, that Jacob must have thought Wow, I'm getting ready to lose another, my other youngest son, my new youngest son now. Uh, uh, so, and, and the only sons to Rachel as well. But that chart, that chart is helpful. Yeah, Larry. Oh, uh, one thing that I found really interesting. You talking about the genealogy here? And I'll uh, confess, I was looking for pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just some drawing. Yeah, yeah. I I landed on page 318. Yeah. Which is the genealogy of Jesus. Right. And I had never seen anything like that before. You have the whole, whole genealogy and the generations here. And I thought that was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. I'll ask no pictures. Yeah. Yeah. No pictures. Okay, so we're going to uh, first watch the video clip that gives us a summary of the chapter. And then uh, we'll jump right into the story production uh, and their comments. And then we'll have some time for discussion. <laughs>
while she's figuring that out. Yeah, we're, we're trying to make it louder. Um, <coughs> so uh, we'll watch those videos in just a moment um, once we figure out our sound problem. Um, what what do you um, th so so let's talk about a couple of, of movements here in this in this chapter, and then we'll uh, we'll catch back up. As Joseph is identified as the favorite. We see right off the bat, uh, even in, in this uh, chapter, that he doesn't have the same, or he doesn't have the same responsibilities as his older brothers, does he? Uh, in fact, the, the chapter opens up that he's inside with his father, and all of the brothers are out um, grazing the flocks. Um, and so <clears throat> you wonder how Joseph might have come to be his father's favorite. Did God have a hand in that favoritism? And, and if so, what, um, what caused that to be? Uh, because Joseph has an amazing ability in his life, and that's, that's to be able to see past the immediate trials and tribulations that he might be going through to see the totality and the end of God's purpose and plan. Um, yeah. He was a dreamer. No, he was called the dreamer. Yeah, the dreamer. 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 So he could interpret dreams. Yes, yes, yes. But, right, if you look at the entirety of Joseph's life, it's this ebb and flow, mm -hmm. and, and we can relate to that as we experience life in the same way, of course. But um, as Joseph, as a young man, Joseph is... Um, is treated, you know, with with great uh, favor from his dad, and and the scriptures tell us that he was well built and handsome, uh, so that that also you know played to his favor, um, and and then on top of that, part of what they connect in that italicized paragraph is that Joseph had the ability to to interpret and dream, and, and and use dream to tell of God's plan. And, and part of what um, his early dreams in, in his teenage years was that, um, that his brothers would bow down before him. And in fact, his dreams were such that, that, the, star, that the, the stars bowed to the moon um, and the animals bowed to one another, right? And, and so that meant for Joseph that, that he was also um, higher I, in authority and power and favor than his brothers. Um, so, so you think about then what gives, what gave Joseph this power and authority, this favoritism over, over others, and how was perhaps God's hand in on that? Um, it also explains a lot of the brothers' uh, contention. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, Janine. I'm also thinking one of the gifts of prophecy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because um, because Joseph ended up saving a lot of folks. He ended up helping a lot of people, a whole nation and, and even neighboring nations, because of his God-given gifts. Um, but his brothers at first didn't feel that way, I'm sure. Uh, in fact, this is outside of maybe Cain and Abel. This is the first picture of a, of a large family that has some serious um, problems and jealousy and dysfunction, right? Uh, because the brothers uh, are so troubled by Joseph's prophecy that they'll one day bow down to him uh, that they decide that they're going to do away with him. They're going to kill him. And it wasn't until Reuben stepped up and said, "He's our own flesh and blood. Let's let's not let's not kill him." That they decide uh, that perhaps they could um, sell him off into slavery uh, to some to some Ishmaelites. Did you catch that in the story in the book? Some Ishmaelites. Where does that come from? Where, who are Ishmael? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So we we asked the question I think last week if um, what came of Ishmael. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the start of 
Yeah. Uh, the Islam religion. That's the start of Muslim uh, Muslims, and uh, because Muhammad is a is a dis descendant of Ishmael. Um, so, and God promised that that Ishmael, uh, that God would make a, a nation, a great nation of Ishmael, right? Um, and so here we here we see this perhaps uh, prophecy, God's work coming uh, to fulfillment. <laughs> Um, because they help to extend God's story and to help continue to build this great nation of Israel that God had promised Abraham long ago. Um, so Joseph sold to the Ishmaelites, to the Egyptian uh, uh, rulers, to, and to, a, um, to a, uh, a, a, a helper of Pharaoh himself, right? Potiphar. Um, and so, so as Joseph's brothers decide to sell him into slavery, that's that's a that's a downturn in his life. Right? Um, but he doesn't lose he doesn't lose hope. He doesn't he sees this as a as a a way of to step over into a new way of faith uh, to to extend God's grace and God's faith. Um, okay, and then. Then what about the, the section of the story where um, uh, Potiphar's wife... <laughs> his good looks wasn't in his favor at that particular No, they weren't, right? Yeah, his good looks got him in trouble. Got him in trouble, that's right. Uh, and in fact, another low point in his, in his life when Potiphar's wife tries to turn the tables on him uh, and... And, and share that, that Joseph tried to come on to her <laughs> and he's thrown into prison. Just a <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> she said it for you. Where did Joseph come up with his wives if he was like in exile? Yeah. Well, they were probably uh, Egyptian wives. You know? mm -hmm. probably, he probably met them, met them and married them. Yeah, and you see children. All of us. But they're they're not I mean let's they're not named in scripture, right? I mean they're, they're it's not. just all of a sudden he's got a son. <laughs> he's got two sons, right? He's got some, yeah. 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 Wives and yeah. all yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, I mean and, and, and by and large, Joseph's time in Egypt was was productive. I mean he got thrown in prison a couple times, but I mean, you know uh, but but you know, without the ebbs and flows of life his, his time in Egypt was very productive, and he, he grew in great responsibility during that time. Um, okay. So then, um, in prison, Joseph continues to earn favor and climbs up in the ranks where he's eventually over, pris over the prisoners. Um, and he is... Oh, we got some... Um, and he is, he, the, the Pharaoh gets word that he can interpret dreams. Uh, and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams to say, these dreams mean that there is about to be seven years of bumper crops of great fruit production, of great harvest, followed by seven years of famine. Uh, and then and Pharaoh decides to put Joseph over managing and stewarding the seven years of bumper crops so that they can endure the seven years of famine. Okay, we'll catch up with the rest of the story there. Let's watch this. Jacob had 12 sons, but his favorite was Joseph. One day, Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brothers who were working in the fields. Joseph's brothers resented him, and when they saw him coming, they attacked him and threw him in the water. Then they sold their brother as a slave, took off his coat, soaked it in goat's blood, and showed it to their father, tricking him into believing a wild animal had killed Joseph. Soon after, Joseph was sold to a military official in Egypt as a servant. God helped Joseph do great work, and the official was very happy with him. Joseph was very handsome, and the official's wife tried day after day to seduce him. One day, she pressured Joseph so much that he ran out of the house, leaving his coat behind. She told everyone that he tried to force himself on her. The official was furious and threw Joseph in jail. God once again helped Joseph in all he did. 
and eventually he was put in charge of all the prisoners, helping run the jail. Joseph had the special ability to interpret people's dreams. One day, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, asked Joseph to interpret one of his dreams. He dreamed that seven fat cows were eaten by seven skinny cows, and seven heads of healthy grain were eaten up by seven heads of dried up grain. God helped Joseph interpret the dream. Egypt would experience seven years of successful farming, followed by seven years of famine. Pharaoh was impressed and put Joseph second in charge of Egypt. During the famine, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt looking for food. When they got there, they met with Joseph, but didn't recognize him right away. When Joseph finally told them who he was, they wept because they were sorry for what they had done. Eventually, they went and got their father, Jacob, and brought him back to Egypt. Joseph took care of his entire family, giving them property in the best part of the land where they live for the rest of their lives. Prison is a hard place to find yourself in. It's one thing if you did something wrong to get there. It's another thing altogether if you're there as a victim versus an victim, <coughs> particularly if your conviction was sponsored by the members of your own family. Well, this is precisely the place that a young man named Joseph found himself in. We're introduced to him at the age of 17. He is the son of Jacob, the grandson of Isaac, and the great-grandson of Abraham. He's a part of this great nation that God in the upper story is slowly building to reveal his presence, his power, and his plan to get all people back. But this family didn't function as one who was going to bring us back into a relationship with God. They could barely get along with each other. Studies show us that firearms in the home are almost always either intentionally or accidentally used on family members versus perpetrators. The same is true for the weaponry of poor character. The handgun of lies and the shotgun of deception were used almost exclusively on every member of Joseph's family, particularly young Joseph. You see, of the 12 brothers, Joposheth was dad's favorite. He even sported a coat of many colors that his dad gave him and left his brothers feeling cold-hearted towards him. And to make matters worse, 
Joseph had several dreams that he believed came from God, where at the end of the dream, all of his brothers were bowing down to him. In his innocence, he shared those dreams with his brothers. His brothers, in turn, declared their little brother their worst nightmare. One day, Daddy Jacob sent Joseph out of the field to fetch his brothers, who were tending to the sheep. They roughed up Joseph and then threw him into a pit. And over lunch, they made the decision to sell their younger brother to a band of gypsies on their way to Egypt. Joseph must have been frightened out of his mind. Once in Egypt, he sold as a slave to serve in the house of Potiphar, the captain of the guard for the mighty Pharaoh. Then there is this surprising sentence that just appears in the story. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Even though God allowed his brothers to abuse him, God is now prospering him. With God's help, Joseph quickly rises and is put in charge of Potiphar's entire house. But then another twist. Another bomb drops. We are told that Joseph was well-built and handsome. And that Potiphar's wife made repeated advancements on Joseph, but he does the right thing and he refuses her. Well, one day she tells her husband that Joseph made an advance on her and she resisted. Joseph's put in prison. Up and down, up and down like a seesaw. But the next thing we know, he's back up again. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. God again allowed for an unjust attack on Joseph and allowed him to go to prison. Yet once in prison, Joseph immediately gains favor and is put in charge of the prison. And one of the things that God did for Joseph was to give him the ability to interpret dreams. The story tells us that he's in prison for about two years when he gets a call from Pharaoh, the main dude, to come and interpret this dream he keeps having. Well, Joseph interprets the dream. Basically, he tells Pharaoh, there's going to be seven years of a bumper crop, or lots of food, and then there will be seven years of famine, no food at all. You know, it's really helpful to know this. Genesis 41, 46 tells us that Pharaoh believes him and puts him second in command over all of Egypt to lead. He's now 30 years old. Seven years of harvest come, and Joseph stores up uh, food to get them through the seven years of famine. No other nation or people group knows what's coming. At the end of the first seven years, the seven years of famine begins, but under Joseph's leadership, they are prepared. Now the famine is affecting everyone everywhere, including his father and his brothers back in Canaan. Jacob, Joe's dad, sends his sons to Egypt to get some food so they don't die. When they arrive in Egypt, they bow down before the second in command of all of Egypt, their punk brother, Joseph, even though they didn't recognize him. Joseph is now 39 years old. 22 years has passed since he was sold down the river, thrown under the bus by his brothers. 22 years passed before the dream he dreamed as a teenage boy came true. After several emotional encounters, Joseph finally reveals his identity to his brothers. Here's what Joseph had to say to them in the story. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified of his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. What Joseph's brothers did to him in the lower story was completely wrong and had lifelong consequences of pain and guilt and depression. As a matter of fact, they could never really ever forgive themselves. But God used their sin-filled jealousy to accomplish his overall purpose, his upper story plan, 
which requires Israel to survive the famine. You see, somewhere in this journey, Joseph captured this, and very few people ever do. This is what enabled Joseph to process all the junk of his brothers and forgive them. Joseph was able to forgive his brothers for what they did to him in the lower story because he captured God's upper story plan. And that's huge. Some of you might think, wouldn't it have been easier for God to use his influence to recommend Joseph for the job instead of making him go through 22 years of struggle? Well, those 22 years of up and down struggles molded Joseph into the kind of man who could do what he did with integrity. Those 22 years gave Joseph an opportunity to see God's hand in life's most hopeless circumstances and situations and to learn to trust in God completely. Joseph, out of his position of power, moves his entire family to Egypt and gives them the fertile land of Goshen. The story tells us that when his dad was getting close to Egypt, Joseph went out in his chariot to meet him. Here's what the story says. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Joseph went on to be 110 years old. Yes, he had 22 tough years, but he ended up with 71 really great ones. And how rich it must have been to know that he was used by God to save Israel and to move God's upper story plan further toward completion. You know, the story is likely being rewritten for your life. Romans 8, 28 tells us, and we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This promise of God tells us that if we love God and align our lives to his upper story purposes, everything in our lives, the ups and the downs, the mountaintops and the valleys, the highs and the hurts, the raises and the rejections, the good and the bad, are all working together to accomplish good. So be patient. Trust God. Let Him mold you during the difficult seasons to equip you for the assignment ahead. You may be in a prison cell right now, either real or figuratively speaking, but if you align your life to God, your story isn't finished. What does Joseph's story tell us about uh, the character of God? What do we learn about God from Joseph's story? He's with us always. He's with us always. Benevolence. Benevolence. He has a plan. He has a plan. Yeah. God loves everybody. God loves everybody. Okay. He promised after um, destroying the earth and, and the flood that he'd uh, make a covenant with us and uh, never fill up, fail to fulfill that covenant. So there's a lot of killing in the Bible and a lot of inhumanity from man to his fellow man, uh, which kind of gives me hope for myself here a little bit, but he never gives up on it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would have been really easy for Joseph um, after being sold into, and, 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 you know, from a perspective of the lower story, I think it would have been really easy for Joseph after being sold into slavery and he got to Egypt to tell his story and get a bunch of Egyptians on his side and go back for revenge against his brothers. In fact, when I think about God's calling Joseph to be that favored child, and the fact that God's hand was definitely in that. Um, I wonder if it were any of the other brothers, any of, uh, if, uh, any of the other 12 brothers, besides maybe Reuben, that would have been in Joseph's place, would they have reacted in the same way Joseph did? By seeing the, the whole story rather than the little parts, the little downturns, um, the, de the valleys in, in his life rather than the mountaintops. Mm -hmm. I, I would, I think that probably any of the other brothers besides maybe Reuben would have wanted re re revenge and would have retaliated against. Can uh, you imagine what was going through their minds and what discussions they were having 
after they had sold him into slavery, and they were going back to tell his father yeah. that he'd been killed by some wild mm -hmm. animal. Right. And then going back out and then coming back in and bringing the father, and he's like, man, we have dug a hole <laughs> so deep. <Yeah. laughs> in fact, I think you can, and that's a good point, I think you can probably put yourself in the place of just about every character in this story. And you see a major ebb and flow. You see highs and lows in their life. I mean, think about being Jacob in this story. And that your your, your sons come back to you and say that they're that his favorite, that your favorite son, uh, Joseph, has been killed by a wild beast. <laughs> and having to, to live with that reality for 22 years uh, before, before he's uh, reunited with with this son that he thought was dead. Um, yeah, the thing about this story to me is that it's like, he never gives up. You know, he could have just, when he got thrown in prison the first time, he could have said, oh, heck with it, I ain't trying no more. I right. had it. Right. It's like he always had the faith that mm -hmm. God had the plan. He mm -hmm. just had to trust that, you know, God always has the plan, it's just not always our time. Right. So I have to wait for what he has planned. He never gave up. He always had faith that God was going to come back and, right. and make him something better. Because yeah. I wonder, I, I have a question, I wonder why he never tried to go back to where his, you know, his father was. Right. Well, um, Joseph certainly had the, the sight to see that God was working in and through him mm -hmm. in, a, in a powerful way. And in fact, if Joseph would not have, if Joseph would have said, "I'm done with this whole Egypt thing. I'm out of here. Let me go home." Um, the the promised nation of Israel that God promised to God's people would would have died because the famine would have occurred. They wouldn't have been prepared, and they would have died. Right. Because this was the 12 tribes of Israel. Right, right. This is it. This is the foundation of, of this promised nation that, uh, that God promised Abraham in the, in the Abrahamic covenant. This is it. Um, so God uses Joseph to continue the building of that nation. Okay. And certainly God's timing is definitely different from ours. I yeah. Mean, yeah, you look at Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. oh, you know, the yeah. time went on, the time went on, the time went on, but it was his timing because he's in charge. Right. It was yes. interesting, too, that God had Pharaoh with the dream. Yes. Because if yeah. Jacob would have had a dream, right. Who would, who would have believed him? Yeah, who would have believed him? God had right. him the dream. Yeah. Him the dream. Yeah. And in fact, if anybody else would have had that dream, would yeah. Pharaoh have believed them, even if it was yeah. a trusted yeah. individual within yeah. Pharaoh's camp? Yeah. yeah. I want to come back to the word, uh, to the to the uh, the thoughts on God's plan, because we've talked about this before. But I think uh, I, I'm very careful to use that kind of language uh, that God that this was you know you hear all the time this was part of God's plan or um, you know that, that that must not have been God's plan for you. Um, now let, let me hear let me hear hear me clearly. Let me uh, speak clearly that. I do think God has will and plan and purpose in our lives. Uh, so, so I wonder, especially in terms of Joseph and his ability to see the greater goodness that God was working within the ebbs and flows of his life, within the highs and the lows. When he's in those lows, when he's in the prison, when he's in the cistern, when he's being sold into slavery, what gives him the ability to be able to see God's greater plan? And then also, let's, let's parallel that to, to life today. When we're going through those lows, when we're going through those ebbs and flows of life, what gives us the ability to be able to see God's upper story plan? Because you hear a lot, you know, we talked about this, I think, with one of the first Wednesday Night Live studies that we did here after I came, um, that you hear a lot, especially at funerals, well, it was part of God's plan for this person to die. Um, and, and, you know, I hear a lot, too, with, with jobs that you lose or job, jobs that you're not hired for uh, or, you know, couples trying to, to conceive a children 
um, you know, that's all throughout life. Well, well, that must not have been part of God's plan. Well, maybe not, but that doesn't help that person. That doesn't comfort that person, right? So, so I'm, I'm really careful with the plan language, and and I wanna I wanna really, you know, I wanna put myself in one of those person's shoes that that's been told to, and say, well, if that's not part of God's plan, what is God's plan? What is God's plan? Janice, okay, I'm gonna say this from a personal standpoint. Please, if you um, if someone has a, a heart and a love for God, I'm saying this from my perspective, that when I'm in my lowest points, I can feel God closer because I have greater need. Mm -hmm. Therefore, um, I'm more open to listen mm -hmm. and to be directed and have that understanding or not, you know, or just pure faith then when I'm at the highs, I also have to remember, you know, the lows. But when I, you're at the highs, then you have to be thankful yeah. and remember God at those moments. But I'm thinking that, you know, from my perspective, when he was at his lowest, that may be when he got his greatest discernment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Martin, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther made a point of writing about that situation where people have their lows mm -hmm. and they go to him for help. Uh, he comes around and he looks at that. This is Martin Luther's take on this as um, kind of a, 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 a confirmation that that individual has faith. He, he finds, God finds a benefit there if you go to him and you're having your problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another way that I think to ask the question is what was God's plan for Joseph? If, if, we, if we indeed say that God has a will, a purpose, and a plan for somebody in their life, what was God's plan for Joseph? He would save his family. He would save many lives. Okay. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right on. So if we so you know, we've had a discussion recently in chapter 1 about free will. It was the brother's choice to sell him into slavery. I don't think for a minute that God had his hand in that. But it all contributed to God's greater plan to save God's people. That Joseph saved lots of people. Um, the situation with Potiphar and leaving his coat behind and her advances at him that was a part of free will. Um, I don't think God manipulated Potiphar to come on to him. And, and you know, uh, that all contributed to God's greater plan, right? And so then I look at that parallel to, to life today and think about, well, what's, what's God's plan for me? What's God's <coughs> purpose for us? <coughs> And I don't think it's that far off from what Joseph's call and plan and purpose was. If we, like Joseph, are called, if God's plan and purpose for us, like Joseph, is to save lives, then that means we are called to a greater mission and ministry just like Joseph. Right? That part of God's plan for us, part of God's will and purpose for us, is to be out in the world like Joseph, Saving lives. And that means spreading the good news that God is faithful, that Jesus is Lord, that uh, we have faith and belief in a God who provides when there's loaves, provides when there's a famine. Uh, we have faith and belief in a God that, that picks us back up during these low times in life. And then I also believe that, that you know, we as people of faith know God's will and purpose for our life is salvation. That that's, that's the end. That you know, no matter how many ebbs and flows we go through in life, we can always see God's will and God's purpose, even in the low times, that God calls us to save lives and to be saved. Right? Um, I feel like I'm preaching. But that's, that's, really, that's really what... You know, when I think about, well, what was God's 
ministry? What was God's plan and purpose for Joseph's life? What's God's plan and purpose for our lives? And then, you know, I think about the funeral where I've heard it being said before that this wasn't a part of God, this was part of God's plan. Um, well, what was God's plan in this? Because I guarantee you, whoever has passed saved lives. Whoever has just passed is receiving God's plan of salvation for them in that very moment. While that's not comforting news to the grieving right then, uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare encourage you to say that to them, uh, but that's what I think we're trying to, to share in words of condolence and sympathy when we say that to someone. It doesn't make it right. Um, but I hope that's what we're trying to share. Um, okay. What else? Well, what? Or come back at me with that. Questions, comments? Go ahead, Jen. Well, I was just going to say, um, when I think about that song, God Bless the Broken Road, and I yeah. feel like um, when you're, you know, if you are, if you're talking to someone else about your faith, um, like for me, hindsight, with my brokenness, like, some of the blessings that have come out of the most tragic situations, like mm -hmm. giving giving that hope to another person, I feel like is is God's plan. Um, and I think with you know, we spend a lot of time in reflection and in His Word, yeah, that is spoken more clearly. Yeah, and it goes back to Romans eight that they uh, reference there at the end that in all things that God works through us for good. Um, and so no matter where the broken pieces lie. Uh, but sometimes, you know, when we're going through the muck and the mud of, of those ebbs and flows of life, that's not helpful either. That how can any good come of this kind of sentiment? Um, but, okay, Ann? Well, uh, just adding to that, a friend of mine, a uh, good singer, was singing for a Christmas memorial for kinder war. And so part of the program was everybody lit a candle and came up the front and said the name of their child and how old they were. And so I'm sitting there and thinking, you know, I had a lot of problems, but I don't have any. Anyway, you listen to this over and over. And then the pastor delivered the message. And the message was, you don't have to say Merry Christmas if you don't want to. And this other message was, they don't want to hear that losing a child is part of God's plan. Right. You mm -hmm. say it right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the last thing you yeah. say. Yeah. 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 It was like, don't, don't do that ever. Well, it's, it's not helpful. <laughs> no. um, God does not micro uh, but, I mean, there were people there that, had, that, that I've heard that, or God yeah. wanted that child more than you did. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that too. That's a terrible, awful thing to say. No, right. I think if we can look at God's plan, not in terms of some kind of micromanaging uh, puppeteer, uh, but God's plan is more upper story level. Right? God's plan is upper story level for all of God's people. For all of humanity, God's plan is upper story level. We can try to put um, our own definition on what that plan might look like. And often because we're human, we, we think of that plan, it, it most closely mirrors success. <laughs> right? And, and, and a, real, a, rig, uh, a real big push right now in Christianity is prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. That God blesses me so much that I can't help but succeed. Pastor Cash. Right? Yeah, Pastor Cash. That's right. Yeah. Um, but, but I don't think, I don't think that's, uh, that's not how God works. Um, so, another thing that I think is really important to take away from this chapter is the provision from God. God always, in, in the, the scripture here, it says that even when he was in prison, that God still was with Joseph. Right? God provided. And, and think about, too, that somehow through these dreams from Pharaoh, 
Egypt was the only nation that knew about this seven years of bumper crop right. followed by seven years of famine. Oh, and we put that, let me see how much time I got. We put that into, um, we paralleled that into the world today. And, and us poor Americans, God bless our hearts, uh, we're the richest country in the world, but we carry the biggest debt, uh, both individually and as a nation. Uh, even if we knew, even if we knew about the seven years of bumper crop, would we have the discipline to save? Probably not. Uh, and and in, you know, even if we didn't know, in times of great success and wealth and excess, do we save? We really don't. We don't have that discipline as, as Americans. Um, so for God to provide for Egypt and neighboring nations in that way, to place Joseph in that moment to be a good steward and a good manager of God's blessings and God's resources, it really teaches us a lot, not only about provision, about God's provision, but about stewardship. Um, that we are called to be those good stewards and good managers of God's blessings. Okay? Yep. Helen? Well, I know that I've uh, heard it in the Bible, but I couldn't tell you where. And that is that, that the Lord tests us. He, he gives us tests. And we can be pretty scared uh, on those situations that happen to us. And uh, But if we just think about it a little bit more and think, well, God is testing us. And, uh, and because of that, we can increase our faith. I mean, the, our faith has to keep growing through all of our life, and it's, it's, it's very important in order to get over those tough times. I definitely think there are places and spaces in our life that help us to grow in our faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether that comes from a test from God or not, I don't know, but I'm glad they're there in my life. Uh, that, that I know that I can walk away from uh, this study or this worship service or these people and be deeper, deeply convicted, uh, grow deeper in my faith, deeper in my uh, discipleship, because that's, that's certainly needed. So that's a good point. What does not destroy you makes you stronger. Amen. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this night and for your word for us today. We thank you for the faith of Joseph. We thank you for his ability to be able to see your greater story, your upper story purpose and plan for his life. And Lord, we pray the same for us, that you give us the strength and the courage to see your upper story plan, that you call us to a great purpose to save lives as your people, as your disciples, that you call us to a great purpose of salvation, and that salvation comes from you. Lord God, we thank you for that gift. We thank you for blessing us and providing for us each and every day. Go with us now. Uh, bring us safely back together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Chapter 4 next week we get into the wilderness.